Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for Indigenous Leaders on Justice and Transforming the Environmental Movement, an event that's co-hosted today by Green 2.0 and the First Nations Development Institute. My name is Adrian Alisea. I'm the Deputy Director here at Green 2.0, where we work to diversify the environmental movement and really ensure that environmental organizations and foundations are inclusive and equitable. We really believe that every person should be at the decision-making table in our movement, but that too often the voices of people of color are absent from the conversations that impact them the most. Today, we're really thrilled to be having this really important discussion. Indigenous Native communities have for long defended lands and natural resources for all, but they've been very historically excluded from decision-making and policy-making. So today, our panel of experts and leaders are going to discuss how the environmental movement needs to transform in order to actually create a culture that allows all voices to lead and thrive and to discuss really how to elevate the leadership of Indigenous and Native communities. I have a few housekeeping notes for today. Before we start, we are live captioning today's event. Um, and you are able to access that. Uh, if you have questions throughout the event, please put them in the question A box. We will try the best of our ability to get to all of our questions, but we may not be able to get to them. So I just apologize in advance, but we will follow up with you to get those questions answered. Also, just a very heartfelt thank you to our partners at First Nations Development Institute. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, your whole team for leading the charge to make long lasting change always and working so hard to develop today's panel. Um, we're just always appreciative of your partnership and leadership. Now I have the real pleasure of introducing a short video from Congresswoman Teresa Ledger Fernandez. She's chairwoman of the Indigenous Peoples Subcommittee in the House. Um, while she couldn't be here with us today, we're really grateful for her short remarks. Um, and excited to hear from her. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for having me here for this very important discussion. I'm Congresswoman Teresa Ledger Fernandez, serving the beautiful and beautifully diverse third congressional district. We're in such an important moment, an important historical moment for our nation, as we build back from a pandemic that has devastated so many of our beloved communities and shed a cruel spotlight on the inequities found in our society, we are faced with a decision to make. Do we take the bold action necessary to build back our communities better than before? To me, it's an easy decision to make. Of course we do. And in this moment, we must also honor our trust obligation to our native communities and tribal governments. We have to build up our communities. We have to build up our resilience. We need prosperity and vibrancy. And it's our role, it's our role in Congress to uphold those trust responsibilities and make sure it happens in a way that empowers each and every Native community. Economic sovereignty. Without economic sovereignty, we cannot have tribal sovereignty. Without climate action and a just transition, we cannot have tribal sovereignty. And without indigenous wisdom, we cannot address the environmental injustice native communities face. That environmental injustice scarred the lungs and bodies of too many native families living with fallout from uranium mines, coal plants, and highways. Those scarred lungs succumbed to COVID as the households beneath giant electric lines lacked basic utilities. Tribal consultation is key to uplift and engage Native nations at every opportunity, especially when it comes to our environment and protecting this beautiful place we call home. For three decades, I've relied on the wisdom of tribal leaders in my previous role. As chair of the Subcommittee of Indigenous Peoples, now I will continue to rely on that wisdom as we chart a just transition. The environmental justice space should be one as beautifully diverse as each of our tribal governments and communities. As a country, we stand to gain from collaborating with indigenous communities. Oftentimes, they are where the most economic vitality and businesses are being built and things happening on the ground. So we must take advantage of that vibrancy. And you know what? If our environmental movement and our clean energy sector are not diverse, we risk the strength, durability, and effectiveness of the movement. We need everyone's valuable perspective and talents because there's no moving forward if we leave anyone behind. Thank you once again for the work you do to ensure that the environmental movement includes 
tribal voices, and indigenous wisdom. You're not alone in this work. Know that myself and so many of my colleagues in Congress are right there with you because we cannot do this alone. Muchisimas gracias. Good afternoon. My name is Mike Roberts. I'm a Clinket tribal member and the president and CEO of First Nations Development Institute. And I'm so excited today that we have indigenous leaders in a conversation on justice and transforming the environmental movement. Before we begin, I'd just like to say thank you to Adrian and the folks at Green 2.0 for partnering with First Nations in this effort, as well as um, a big um, thank you to Representative Ledger Fernandez for her opening remarks. Um, today, we are joined by three panelists. Um, we will be going through a series of questions and discussions, and hopefully at the end, we'll leave a little bit of time for questions and answers from those of you who are on the podcast this afternoon. Um, so let me begin. Um, our, our panelists today um, are, I'm pretty excited to announce. Um, the first one is Bernadette Dementative from, um, who is the executive director of the Gwich'in Steering Committee. Um, she was born in Fort Yukon, Alaska, and spent her time, her summers in Venati, Alaska. Um, she is a grandmother and a mother, um, and um, has spent a lot of her life in um, advocation for the, Alaska, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge Coastal Plain, the Porcupine Caribou Herd, and the Gwich'in Way of Life. Um, Bernadette also serves as an advisory board member for the Indian Collective, Care for Creations Task Force, and the Native Movement of Alaska, and Defend Sacred Alaska. Our second panelist is Asia Dakota. She is the interim director, executive director for the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, um, also a, a grantee of First Nations, long-term grantee of First Nations. Um, she is a tribal citizen of the Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakima Nation. Um, and her lineage includes Cayuse, Nez Perce, and Turtle Mountain, Mountain Chippewa. Um, Asia has been a long-term watershed department manager for CRITFIC. Um, she holds an undergraduate degree from Dartmouth University and a master's from Yale, the Yale School of the Environment. And finally, our last on panelists is Miria Alicia um, from Zakana. Um, and she's a climate justice organizer, educator, and storyteller dedicated to protecting the sacredness of Mother Earth. She was born um, a migrant farm worker um, or in a migrant farm worker community. Her struggle for liberation and justice exists at the intersection of um, migrant justice, climate justice, and indigenous rights. Um, in 2019, she received a National Emerging Leader Award from Green Latinos and the internationally recognized EE 30 Under 30 Award from the North American Association for Environmental Education. So welcome. I'm excited to have um, this conversation and to hear from all three of you this afternoon. Um, let me begin by asking each of you um, to introduce yourself, your name, where you're from, um, the work that you do, and what it means for you to be an indigenous person in the environmental justice movement. And maybe we could start with Bernadette, move on to Asia, and then um, end with, with Niria. Thank you. Um, my name is Bernadette Dementi. I'm the executive director for the Gwich'in Steering Committee, which was founded in 1988 by the elders and chiefs of the Gwich'in Nation. And our mission is to protect the uh, calving grounds of the porcupine caribou herd, which we consider very sacred. Um, to uh, be a part of this movement um, is very important to me, just because I love my grandchildren very much. Um, and because of the changes that I witness. Right now in Alaska, we are um, 
witnessing a lot of changes and I'll share more of that a little later. But I'm a grandmother of six and a mother of five. Um, and I deeply care about um, the future generations and our people. Merci, Cho. Thank you. Um, thank you all uh, for being here today. And thank you for the invitation to be on this uh, really great panel with this very impressive women. So very excited uh, to be here. Um, as Mike said, my name is Asia Dakota. I am a citizen of the Yakima Nation. I grew up on the Yakima Reservation in Wapta, Washington. Um, I also have lineage, as he said, with Cayuse, uh, Nez Perce, and Turtle Mountain Chippewa. I am currently in Portland, Oregon, um, serving as the interim executive director for the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. Um, I've worked for over 20 years now in various capacities, um, whether it's forestry, uh, wildlife, uh, various environmental. Um, management uh, positions and, and now fisheries for the last uh, almost 13 years. Um, the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission represents four tribes who have treaty reserved rights, um, not to not just limited to the reservations, but to our the areas that we ceded to the government um, when we made our treaties in 1855. So it's approximately about 165 million acres. Uh, we have a really clear mission that can be stated pretty pretty bluntly. It's to put, put fish back in the rivers and protect the watersheds where they live, to protect our treaty fishing rights and sovereignty uh, within our four tribes, uh, to share uh, our salmon culture, and also to provide uh, services to our fisher people along the river. So um, CRITFIC, which is our acronym, uh, we represent uh, the Yakima Nation in Washington State, the Nez Perce tribe in Idaho, and the Warm Springs and Umatilla tribes in Oregon. Uh, we um, have about 150 miles of the Columbia, Lower Columbia River, where we um, manage our resources and our fish and have treaty rights to. Uh, you know, going back to where, who we are and where, where we come from, um, you know, we've been shaped for millions of years by, by the Columbia River. And as such, our culture and religion are based and defined by the abundance of salmon in the river and what we call our first foods, which is not only the fish, but um, which are salmon, Pacific lamprey, sturgeon, but also the game, the deer, the elk, um, our bitter roots, our me medicine plants, and our berries, which are, and most importantly, um, the river, the water that gives life to all of it. So. Um, it can really be stated bluntly that our natural resources are our cultural resources. And this is uh, evident in our creation story, um, in how the creator provided these foods with an understanding of reciprocity. So if we take care of these first foods, um, these resources, they will in turn take care of us. And so um, thinking about uh, the environmental justice movement and this panel, um, you know, for generations, we have seen changes to our lands, rivers, um, and cultural resources from development and pollution, and now um, a changing climate. So when I think about being a leader in this movement, I'm really just providing the voice for not only the tribes that uh, I represent, but also on behalf of the foods and the salmon and the water who don't have a voice. Um, and it's really for the continued survival and resilience of our tribes and our people. So. I know that um, tribes can't do it by ourselves, um, although we've been, um, our efforts have definitely put a positive impact in these resources, but there's really great power in sharing our messages, um, our history, our culture, our connection to the land and river and the resources. Um, and there's a lot of great power in, in developing innovative partnerships and relationship with others to elevate our messages and our priorities. So um, at this moment, I think there's a lot of hope with the new administration and putting key Native people in key positions within the federal government um, that will allow for significant progress to be made, um, not just within the policies um, that affect us as tribes, but also on the ground itself. So um, I'll leave it right there. Thank you so much. I guess I'm next. <laughs> um, uh, just, um, hmm. Just uh, giving thanks for this day, giving thanks to everyone here um, on this uh, webinar today, wherever you are, um, asking that the creator can be with us for this very important talk, open up our hearts and our ears to listen to whatever it is we need to hear today and just asking creator and ancestors to 
guide me, guide us, uh, so that this conversation can bring good things for Mother Earth um, and the next seven generations. Kualito Nali, my name is Nidia Alicia. I am Chicana Indígena. I am a descendant of the Purepecha and Matlacinta people by way of my mother and Raramuri descendant by way of my father. However, I am born on occupied Tacoma lands in the Pacific Northwest. So um, though I have an ancestral responsibility to my seeds and my my community. I also, as an indigenous woman living on a territory that is not ancestrally mine, hold a responsibility to stand um, and speak up for the waters here and the salmon, like this, our relative just spoke, you know, um, we owe everything uh, to salmon. Um, we owe our redwoods to salmon. We owe um, all of the bounty that was here uh, for us, um, we owe it to the salmon. And so, you know, being, the, I'm not going to say how old I am, but I'm pretty sure y'all can guess because <laughs> people either think I'm 18 or I'm 40, uh, depending on uh, what, I'm, what I'm talking about. But it, you know, it's a really, really pressing time. And I'm so moved by what, um, um, Asia just shared um, before us around how like we really need to be thinking creatively about what kinds of partnerships um, we are going to create and more than anything what what kinds of relationships are we feeding in these times uh, what is our relationship to ourselves look like what is our relationship with our families what is our relationship with the land that we live on, whether it be that you live on your ancestral land or you live on someone else's land, what is your relationship um, to the land that holds you and takes care of you? Um, it's really important right now that I think the world recognize that um, it is time for indigenous wisdom to lead. Um, lead in the issues that our generation is facing because it is it is not about um it is not about just doing the right thing it is about doing the necessary thing and we know that in our creation stories in our seeds in our cultures in our languages there is wisdom that is really really technologically advanced even though it has not been seen that way um, because of colonization um, this is wisdom that is thousands and thousands of years old that is so important for us to incorporate into our strategies and the work that we are doing to protect mother earth and quite honestly not save her but save ourselves uh, Mother Earth doesn't need to be saved. She's been through so much and will continue to carry on. It's just about, uh, it's about us as humanity, as a human family to um, come to the realization that we need to work in a good way so that we can continue to exist here as a peoples. So I'll, I'll pause there, um, but it's an honor to be with you all and to see um, what this conversation brings on with them. Thank you, all, all three of you. Um, I, I think it's safe to say that the IPCC report on climate um, didn't come as a shock to indigenous peoples that we've been living on the front of this climate change and suffering the result of climate change for years. Um, I would love to hear from each of you how um, are, how are indigenous and native communities leading in addressing climate change? And maybe we can start with Asia, go on to Nuria, and then end with Bernadette on that one. Sure, thank you, Mike. Um, and thank you, Nuria and Bernadette, for those great introductions. Um, you're right, uh, the IPCC climate report was not a shock in any way. Um, I know it was for other people, but for us, it's just what we've been living and enduring and understanding for generations and generations. Um, and indigenous people in particular are the most climate sensitive communities because of our dependence of the, on the land and the resources that are provided, um, and particularly the first foods and with our tribes. Um, and we've seen these changes. We've seen the shifting in, in fields of medicinal plants or camas roots. 
we've seen the salmon runs decline to um, really dire levels and we've seen um, things just been lost completely, become extinct or completely moved out of some of our traditional grounds. And um, it's really about uh, tribes taking a leadership um, uh, in, in a lot of these ways. And, and we've what we've done at Critvik is we've developed a, a restoration plan and called Akanishmi Wakishwit. And in our language, that means the spirit of the salmon. And it looks at the entire life cycle of the salmon. So the very beginning where it, uh, that salmon is an egg and a tributary to it's traveling out, um, out of the tributary into the Columbia River and, and then out into the ocean, spending lots of time in the ocean and then coming back to the exact same point where it was born and spawning and dying to replenish the water and the nutrients. It's, it's a cyclical life cycle, which is really how tribes operate. Um, thinking about the first foods and the seasonal round of all of our resources and how we've moved with the resources for, for millennia, really. And we continue to do that to this day. Um, so really taking control of looking at a plan. Um, it's the only plan that exists that in includes the entire life cycle of the salmon in the entire Columbia River Basin. Um, and it, that was started in 1995 and today it still exists to that day. There's no other plan that looks at that. Um, when we started as an organization in 1977, um, it was just a handful of people and it was white people. You know, it wasn't, we weren't leading, um, but there was a clear understanding that four tribes coming together would be stronger um, than one tribe, especially on the heels of um, you know, the civil rights movement, the American Indian movement and the fish wars that were happening along the Columbia River and in the Puget Sound um, in the 1970s. And what we've done since then is we now have within the four tribes and within my organization, over 600 fisheries staff um, within the Columbia River Basin, which is more than um, the states and the federal agencies in the Columbia River Basin. So we've now become not only the authority, but the experts in the region. And so we have a genetics lab where we're doing world-class research and genetics um, research on our salmon with our data, our own data, not using anybody else's data. Um, we have science, uh, climate uh, scientists modeling the river um, looking at the future of climate change and what that would mean with a focus on habitat and water quality and quantity. Uh, we recently um, brought into our program an estuary and monitoring program because we recognize that um, that's one piece of the life cycle that we just didn't have a good handle on what's going on in the estuary and ocean when our fish aren't coming back. Why? Um, so we've, we've now inherited this or developed this uh, research and um, estuary monitoring program to help us understand what's happening because that's a big piece of the puzzle that we really need to uh, get more research into. Um, and then we've, um, with our tribes, we've developed um, climate needs assessments. We've, um, our tribes on their own have developed, like many other tribes um, and indigenous stations, uh, climate adaptation plans that look at forecasting what climate change will look like into the future, how will it affect certain resources, and if it will, what is our plan to address those? And so I think We've always, you know, climate change is not new to us. We've, we've always seen the changes in everything that's happened with our resources over, over generations. And I think at this point in time, it's just a recognition of what we've always already been doing using traditional ecological knowledge, using modern science, using what we've already known to just now, our, our messages and, and our work is now being elevated to a level where it's not just recognized, but it's being uh, it's being counted on by by local, federal, and state people, and policies and programs because we're the ones doing the work on the ground. And so, I think there's um, so many innovative uh, collaborations happening out there with not just within the tribes but within their communities to look at climate issues. I think um, water quantity is going to be a big issue, obviously, into the future. And we're seeing so many groundbreaking um, proposals and projects about. Uh, people who have or or factions who have never gotten along um, and with the tribes or with conservation communities or with environmental organizations who all recognize that we all have one need of water into the future. And so how do we all provide water for fish in the river? How do we all provide water for agriculture, for municipality use, for flood mitigation, you know, for hydropower? How do we figure this out together so that we're all working together so that we all have a piece of this water um, for our own priorities and purposes and not just one side is getting everything. So I think the tribes are really innovative. We've always been innovative and um, 
I think that we're doing really great work. And, and I know that's just like a snippet of what's happening in, in the basin. And I know there's so many great success stories out nationwide and worldwide. And, um, and yeah, I'll just stop there. So thank you. Thank you. Nuria? Um, so I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm recalling a time uh, when I was in ceremony on the, the opening ceremony of the Run for Salmon journey. and. Um, when one of our elders wounded me, he said um, that, you know, there would be a time when um, right now there's wars happening for oil. And he said that there would be a time when um, war wars would break out over water. And I think we're seeing that. I think we're seeing that with the droughts. I think we're seeing that with uh, the lack of protection. And I think we're seeing that because um, as a humanity, we have forgotten about the sacredness of water. We have forgotten about how much we owe everything to water and capitalism, colonialism has infiltrated many of us to see it as something to be used, something for our benefit, something that serves us and not for who water is, you know? And if we just um, close our eyes for a moment, um, I invite us to imagine water flowing through the veins of every living thing that has ever existed on mother earth. And just think for a moment, what wisdom does that water hold, knowing everything that has ever lived on Mother Earth so intimately? And so um, I share this story because, um, like I like I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm I'm an indigenous woman living on uh, on territory that is not my own, but I have a responsibility to my seeds so therefore I have a responsibility to um, stand with um, my relatives on this territory and I've been honored to um, be following and being in service to salmon and to waters um, with Chief Callie and Sisk of the Winnemum Wintu and for the past six years we have um, led this prayer along um, the largest watershed in California um, along the Sacramento River and up the McLeod, uh, because um, we know that since the Shasta Dam was put on the McLeod, the salmon have, have not come home. And several years ago, when the Winnemum went to, um, when Chief Kelly Sisk and the Winnemum went to, went into prayer, the uh, spirit said that um, they needed to, to take a stand. And um, they, they did a war dance on the Shasta Dam and that made news all over the world. And at that time, the Winnemum Wintu had believed that their salmon were completely gone because um, the, there was no, there's no fish ladder on that dam. And so um, what had happened is when the news went out about that, um, the Maori, uh, people reached back out to the women and said, we have your fish, do you want them back? And so um, in the 1800s, salmon were so abundant. There was millions and millions of salmon. There was not just one run, they ran year round. And um, a lot of eggs were taken from the McLeod River and they were taken to different rivers. And the only place where they were successfully introduced were in um, the, right uh, river in Aotearoa and so you know um, how are indigenous people leading in climate change um, we're we're working in an intertribal way um, to bring back uh, these genetically pristine salmon that came that were put by the creator on the McLeod River and were taken and so um, you know we're leading by faith we're leading by honoring traditions, honoring ceremonies, honoring water, and we're leading by following uh, salmon 
and following the water. Um, you know, as humans, you know, you can, you can look at this whichever way, you could look at it through a spiritual way, you could look at it through a scientific way, but salmon are 2 million, 6 million, you, I, I'm, I'm not even know what the actual number is, but they're millions of years old. Humans are only 200,000 years old. So like, if we're talking about who really needs to be leading in climate issues, it's it's the salmon, it's these plant beings that, and you know, it just so happens that as indigenous people, we have not forgotten our responsibility and our um, relationship to these wise beings that, that are our helpers. So um, that is who is truly leading and that is who we lead and that is who we follow. Thank you, thank you. Bernadette? <clears throat> Hi, thank you. Um, thank you, ladies. Uh, I just want to share that right now in Alaska, we are witnessing climate change two to three fast, two to three times faster than the rest of the world. Um, we have damn dead, we have th thousands of dead fish in our rivers and our lakes, dead birds literally falling from the sky, and ticks that something that we've never um, had up here. And uh, and then we have an elected leadership that refuse to listen to our voice, to listen to um, our concerns. And so we are forced to you know, travel across the country, go to Washington DC and ask other elected leadership to um, help us because ours refuse to. We have 33 coastal communities eroding into the ocean and I know that climate change is impacting um, the country um, as the rest of the world. But right now, the, the things that I see, it really concerns me. I don't want my children to be struggling to survive because I fail to use my voice. We have record breaking fires. Um, last year, I had to stay in my home three days uh, because we couldn't come out, it was too much smoke. We are surrounded by fire. Um, and I know that's happening all across the country. Um, and uh, our, you know, our leadership has always led in climate, I mean, when it comes to climate change, we have been um, sharing with con congressional leaders what's been happening. Um, some of them listen, some of them don't, and, uh, but we never give up. Um, one of the things is that climate change don't care what color we are, don't care if we're rich or we're poor, we are all going to be negatively impacted. And it's time that we start sticking our differences aside, come together, and I know we can't stop climate change, but we can prepare our future generations. We can um, transition off fossil fuels, and, um, you know, start um, leaving, trying to think about leaving behind a livable um, land world for our children. Um, look at, okay, so we need to start like learning about each other's issues. Um, we've been making um, connections, well, in Alaska, um, the Native Movement and Wichita Steering Committee has been making many um, connections across the, um, across the country with other tribes. Because in Alaska, you know, I was born into a corporation and it's very different up here. Um, it's not, um, you know, a tribe versus tribe issue. It's a corporation versus tribe issue up here. And um, the corporations do not have human rights. The tribes do, we do. And we are going to be the ones who have to live with the impacts that, of the destruction that they're gonna cause. And so, you know, giving up is not an option for us. Um, whether we're living down in Texas, in Arizona, California, Alaska, um, we are um, the protectors of these lands and we understand that that's our survival. We are interconnected to our land, to our water and to our animals. 
and we will always lead in, in protecting them. Uh, thank you, Basi. Thank you. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead a little bit. Um, you know, when we look at the, the Green 2.0 2020 report, we see that the, the larger environmental organizations have only a added a handful of, of people of color to their staffs and boards and senior management. At the same time, we're seeing that the large foundations who support environmental justice in this, in this country um, do it to the tune of about $1.3 billion, yet less than 2% goes to organizations led by people of color. Um, I guess I'm, my question for each of you is, um, how do we hold these, these institutions, these environmental organizations, and these public foundations accountable to the environmental justice movement? And how do we get them to seek more representation and add more funding to people of color led organizations like all of yours. And maybe, you know, we could start that conversation with, with Nuria and move on to Bernadette and then Asia. I actually need more time to think about it. So if we, I, I'm happy to go last. Okay, Asia, would you like to start? Uh, sure, thanks Mike. Um, yeah, this is this is a great question and something that you know we've been grappling with for a really long time because there is definitely a lack of diversity um, that many organizations in the environmental community and NGOs in particularly face. Um, and I think it's it's our responsibility to ask questions. You know, it's 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 us looking at what they're doing um, and how maybe they're partnering with tribes. Um, what is what is their relationship with tribes? What tribal uh, ceded territories or lands do they occupy? Do they even have a relationship? Um, and then it's and then it's other questions like um, how do I get a seat on a on a board? How do I um, become engaged with the staff? How do I um, what is their goal for DEI diversity, equity, and inclusion? Because I think. Um, there are definitely, um, there's a wide range of NGOs and where they're at in this process. And I think I've been, um, I'm, I'm on a couple boards, a local land trust um, and also a national board of earth justice. And they're both grappling with the same issue um, is trying to, how do we diversify staff and board? Um, and I think um, a great example is the work that earth justice is doing because they um, have uh, not only developed relationships, but um, their clients are, are many tribes. Um, and of course, Earth Justice is an organization that often um, pursues lawsuits on behalf of tribes, um, but puts tribes in front. And I think that's a key message too, because uh, the tribes should always be at the front of these issues and it shouldn't be some other organization um, leading the way. It should be them supporting the tribes in their efforts. Um, and I think Earth has done a great job in recent years because they've um, not only been working with tribes and were, you know, part of the Standing Rock and No Dapple um, issues, but also uh, they've now developed a separate tribal partnerships program with tribal attorneys and tribal staff. And I think that's really a, an example of, of one way, not the only way, but one way that organizations can look at not just integrating Native people and Native perspectives onto their staff and their boards, but developing a separate program that looks at those issues specifically. So I think um, there also has to be a recognition that, of course, uh, you know, one person does not speak on behalf of all 574 tribes in the U.S. and then more of the Indigenous nations in Canada. You know, there is sometimes this generalization, this tokenism that happens. Um, and that's something that um, may occur in the beginning, but it's not something that you can't change. If you are the only person on a board or within the staff, you know, it's your responsibility to, to bring in others, to bring in your perspective, to have a voice, um, to, to really look at the organization's structures and ask those questions that maybe they've never been asked before. Um, and I think so, uh, of course, finding diversity within the tribal voice is incredibly important too, because you can't just have one person who may, I may only have a background in fisheries and natural resources, but we need somebody else with a background in healthcare. We need, we need a lawyer. You know, we need all these other people and all these other voices and expertise to help these environmental organizations understand tribal priorities, engage with tribes on their terms um, and, and in, their, in the ways that they want not to be forced upon, you know, here we have money for you to do this. No, here's some money. What would you like to do with it? Or how can we help and support your programs and your organization. Thanks. Thank you. Bernadette, you wanna take up that question? Yeah, um, sure. Well, one um, way 
that I've been seeing changes within the um, organizations that I work with is I just use um, my voice. I think when your voice is one of the most powerful tools that you have and that you have to use it even when, in, when you're in uncomfortable places um, like Alaska Wilderness League, the Sierra Club, Earth Justice, um, Trustees of Alaska. Um, in the past three years, um, you know, I just shared what I've been taught by my elders and chiefs of the Gwich'in Nation of Alaska and Canada. And um, that's to work in a good way, um, not to compromise our position and um, to go out and tell the world that we are here. And that to, to work in a good way is not always, um, that's a very simple sentence, but it's not always easy when you're up against dishonesty and misleading statements from our own um, leadership that's in, in Congress. So, um, you know, we just continue to um, share, continue to be loud, um, be proud of who you are, be proud of the people we've come from, we have, um, I, I always love to say that we've come from some of the most powerful people that ever walked this earth. You know, they are master survivalists. And so I just, um, I really think that communication with our partners is very important. And uh, I have seen the changes that have been being made. and. Um, you know, it's, it's up to us to, they don't, sometimes they don't know what they're doing and what they're not doing and what's respectful. And what's, their common sense and our common sense are not the same. Um, we're different people, but we do need each other and we can learn some stuff from them. They can learn some stuff from us. Um, but right now we do need to stand together for our future generations. Nuria? Yes. So I think there is one way of thinking that really just quite honestly needs to die. And that is that we are, as Indigenous communities, communities of color, historically disenfranchised communities, we do not need help. What, and I know it's, it's like, yes, but we do, we have all these issues. We are trying to help the world. Because our pain and suffering, you know, like I think one of my sisters just shared earlier is like the apocalypse has been ongoing for some of us for maybe 500 years. And so there's this sentiment, I think, in the sector that, well, yeah, we're trying to help. We're trying to help. We're trying to give you. It's like, no, we are trying to help the world. We're trying to help humanity understand what our sacred positionality is in the web of life. And so, um, it is not so much that we're trying to be help, helped. It's that we're trying to be, you know, wake up the world to recognize that our wisdom needs to be leading now more than ever. And so in or, if folks can understand that, then we can move into the conversation about accountability, right? And that's one of the things that I love about Green 2.0 is that, um, there's this report card that goes out every year uh, with organizations that do consent to being transparent. And it's the best, I, it's I think one of the most effective tools right, that we have right now is because that report card calls for transparency. And so we cannot shift a culture. We cannot shift the way things continue to go. We cannot shift the status quo if people aren't willing to be held accountable. And if people aren't willing to be transparent about the data. And um, another thing that I think is important um, that, I, that I want to name on how organizations and you know, governments and foundations can support is elevating people to positions that are rightfully ours, right? You know, we need indigenous women, black women, women of color, as executive directors in leadership positions. And that's one of the things that we see is that, oh yeah, we, we increased our staff by 20%, but most of people are, you know, in admin, in operations, they're not, their voice is not leading in the decision-making of what programming priorities 
need to be we need to be getting funding for or what is the type of culture we need to be creating in these organizations, right? If I did not have my culture, my ceremony, I would have burnt out from this work a long time ago. And a lot of us in this sector get burnt out because there's white leadership perpetuating white culture that is entrenched in colonialism and white supremacy and disposability. And that can't continue to happen. So um, another way that um, I think we can support meaningful work is supporting indigenous led organizations um, that um, supporting tribes, you know, that have that cultural understanding that have a different cosmo vision, you know, one of the things that I love about that the Zapatistas say, and I'm going to give them a big shout out is we need a world where many worlds can live, right. And I think um, that it's important for us to really understand that now more than ever, especially with you know, this IPCC report that has just reminded us, it's kind of been salt on our wounds, you know, because some of us have been witnessing the drastic loss in biodiversity of our, the loss of our seeds, our life ways, our cosmovisions, a lot of our youth have lost, you know, connection to our elders, to our ceremonies, uh, to our way of viewing the world, because we're pushed into this society where we need to get a career, we need to think the way that white society wants us to think and it's time that we start to get a little bit uncomfortable with recognizing that we need in order to have um a shift in the culture so we're so where our youth can be in power you know i just read this article about how there's uh, millions of young people right now that are just depressed suicidal they don't want to live because of all of this horrific news and so what my question is what are we doing for our young people who will be the elders witnessing um, the things that we are just now, that, that we are presenting to them, that we are causing, that people before us are causing. So let's not forget the young people. Let's not forget the importance that we're not, be, we don't need to be given handouts or be helped. We're here to help and work together. And let's not forget that now more than ever, if, if the climate is changing, we need to be drastically changing with it. Cool. You know, I think this, that was a, a nice segue into some of the, the questions that, uh, that folks have posed um, for, the, for, the, for the panelists. And, and the first one that, that, that comes up is, um, how are young people within indigenous communities getting involved in the environmental justice movement? And maybe Bernadette, we could start with you, move on to Asia, and then um, Nirya, you know, this, 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 you seem to, it just seems to be a passionate, um, subject of yours. So maybe we can end with you on that question. Um, so the Gwich'in Steering Committee, we organized our first Gwich'in News Council. And um, they have already traveled to many um, climate um, justice rallies, meetings. Um, they are going to have um, a conference with um, one of the scientists at the UAF. So, um, you know, it takes, like one of the youth told me, um, thank you for this. You know, um, everybody's always talking about the youth, the youth, but they don't do anything. But it takes both sides. I said, you can't give me credit for that. You showed up. And um, so it takes commitment. This work is not easy. Um, not everybody's going to be able to do it. I have saw that firsthand. Um, people want to pop in and out, and that, but we need it consistently, especially right now. Um, but what I do really, really um, like to see is uh, the youth that have been stepping up. Um, this is not a, um, a problem they created. So they should not be stepping up alone. We should be step, stepping up right beside them. We should be um, standing with them, not behind them, but right with them. Because um, I, the, a lot of the youth that I speak with, they're concerned about their future. And, um, and so am I. So, just including them in meetings. Um, anytime I go anywhere, I always bring a youth member, whether it's, I try to bring more than one, but sometimes it's not always possible, but
but always include them. Let them speak first. And um, yeah, just have them be involved. Thank you, thank you. Asia? Yes, thank, thanks for the question. Um, you know, it's, it's so encouraging um, to see uh, more of a leadership from our indigenous youth who are really concerned about um, their future. I mean, they, they, our decisions today impact them and their future generations down the road. So we, they are concerned and you see that. I mean, they're, they're more outspoken. Um, they're on the front lines. They're defending our lands. They're defending our water, you know, and they're getting more involved and more engaged. And I think um, what's really great to see too is that the media is reflecting some of this. And, and it's not just in terms of the environmental justice movement, but in general, the, the media about native people it needs to be positive so that when our kids, you know, I have a, a seven-year-old, a five-year-old, and a two-year-old, um, see these representations of themselves that it's in a positive way. And, um, you know, I think about reservation dogs and the how they look at, you know, youth in a, in a very realistic way that exists today in this environment in one, one section. You know, it's not everybody's experience, but I think getting more positive media is really going to benefit our, our, leader, our leadership from, from our youth. Um, I think within um, CritFit, what we're doing is uh, really putting a lot of emphasis on workforce development programs. So looking at cradle to career or, or really baby board to career. And, and it begins with the culture. It's developing a love and interest for what's important to us and then developing those skills. So building curriculum at the younger, um, younger ages from you know, pre-K all the way up. We have a, a salmon camp. Um, that we put on for middle school students to get them out in the woods for a whole week, you know, seven days. Um, and then we hire high school students to be counselors so that they also get a leadership experience and have that interaction. Um, we take them fishing, we go sweat, we do a lot of cultural uh, activities, we spend a lot of time outdoors, we take them to a college campus, many for their first time to see what it looks like, what do you need to get into college, how do other you know, talk about other people's careers and how they got to that point or what was their interest that really made them want to be in fisheries or natural resources. Um, and then and then go further than that, develop pathway for jobs. So we have internship programs, we are developing graduate programs and fellowships within our tribes and within our organizations. And it's really just developing these connections at the younger age that I think will really pay off um, into the future. Um, and, and of course, funding them. So finding finding those programs that tribal tribes and tribal organizations have and funding them because those are so crucial. Cool. Nuria? Thank you. Yeah, so um, we have this belief in, in, um, in that, uh, you know, and I think, you know, mainstream whatever beliefs kind of like tamper it, but, uh, in our in in my culture, we believe in um, in young elders and reborn elders that come through. Um, and uh, right now, we're seeing a lot of them coming through. And you know, like I don't know if you've ever ran come across one of your nieces or nephews or young person. You're like, did that just come out of your mouth? <laughs> like these kids that are coming through in these times are really really powerful. And so we need to decolonize our minds from thinking that we are that we have to teach the children. A lot of kids that are coming through are coming to teach us. And so we need, it's important that we remember that. And I know that it's not just in my culture that there's that belief because there's other um, indigenous relatives um, that I've had conversations with about this who also um, believe in that. And so, and in these times, you know, I, I'm not a parent um, I am in my 20s, so, but I don't consider myself a youth because, you know, like I work with young people. So I'm not going to say how old I am. Crap, maybe. I, okay. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking about uh, these two young tribal members uh, that were on Run for Salmon this year and um we were gonna go out canoeing you know we do 300 miles we laid down prayers on 300 miles of that river and we walk we paddle we run we do whatever we do it all and it, it, there was really really bad smoke that day um that had come through and um my heart just about broke being um, thinking that you know it would be too smoky for us to put down our prayers um because we were surrounded by wildfires um but 
uh, you know, the kids were adamant. Nechai and Maya were like, we want to paddle. You know, Nechai's eight and Maya, I think, is like four. And so we put N95 masks on them and there they went paddling. And I just remember standing on the deck and I almost want to cry because I'm like <laughs> thinking so much about how um, we are going to be um, needing to humble ourselves to really just let ourselves follow the children because the children know what to do. You know, I remember putting that mask on Nechai and he just carried on, you know, he just went on and I, I saw the young elder in him. I saw the old man in him as he paddled away, kind of like, you know, um, you know, in the midst of so much despair and hopelessness, um, trusting that our ancestors are sending some of the most, um, powerful um people to help us in in this in this difficult time and so we need to raise you know i'm not a parent but we need to raise strong children you know the kids want to do something the youth want to do something and so uh, we need to create um, spaces for them to lead you know for them to feel in their power for them to step into uh that eldership that they're coming to to grow up into and so um yeah, I, I'll just leave it at that. And also say, you know, a lot of my friends right now are stopping line three, getting arrested. So that's what most of my my friends that are my age and younger than me are doing right now. Um, those that have uh, found their courage um, to go out there and, and do what we know must be done. And so I'm going to drop the bail fund link because, you know, if we're trying to support our youth, our indigenous youth, it starts with keep getting them out of jail. And I know that I'm not the only one here, you know, like, so if um, I want to invite my sisters to also share, you know, whatever support links that, that you have so that we can really support the youth because um, that they have, I truly believe they have come, we have come, I guess I'm still a youth, um, to, you know, in this moment to help humanity in a good way. Thank you very much. I know we have just a very short time left. And I was wondering, um, Asia and Bernadette, if you wouldn't mind sharing with the, the group, what gives you hope? Um, you know, we're, we're, we talk about all the, all the bad things that are happening and the injustice in, for indigenous communities and um, the kind of the unfair disadvantages that are, that are pushed upon natives for hundreds of years. But you get up every day and fight this fight. What it, why is it that you do that? What is it that gives you hope? What makes you go on? Asia? Sure, thanks. Um, I could talk about this for a long time, but I know we're <laughs> limited. Um, I'll just say, you know, my kids, you know, my kids, I want them to grow up in a, an environment and a world that I did, which was an appreciation for the land, the water, uh, to be able to hunt and fish, to gather our roots, gather our berries, to sing our songs, to practice our religion, um, and, and have that bountiful for generations and generations. So it's not just my kids, but my future grandkids and grandkids and grandkids. I mean, it's not just seven generations. It's like 25. It's like 100. That's the, how we think about our decisions today. And so, um, and seeing, and I said this before, but seeing all of the new appointees in this administration gives me great hope that there can be change. And I, I'm excited about it. I, I, I think the next three years are going to be really informative about how you know the future is really going to look. And I think we can make a lot of progress. Well, Bernadette, you want to wrap us up here and tell us what gives you hope? Um, prayer. Um, I'm, a stream, I'm a strong believer in the power of prayer. And um, I'm very spiritual. So I um, always stay strong in prayer every day. I pray to stay humble. Um, and just the hope, I, the youth, like seeing them standing up, so many of them are just so outspoken and they are the next leaders. Um, I have an actual picture up here of about 30 elders that I always look up um, to whenever things get hard for me, because you're right, it's not easy. It's not easy work. Um, but the prayer is all that I have to say. Um, creator, the higher power is what gives me the push, what gives me the strength. And um, just knowing that our ancestors are with us um, gives me the 
gives me the push that I need on the hard days. Thank you. Thank and, you. And, uh, and these amazing women. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, you know, I, to the audience and to the folks at Green 2.0, thank you very much for, for this last hour. And especially to Bernadette and Asia and, and Neria, thank you for your time and your wisdom. And uh, keep up the good fight. Thank you very much.